<laughs> well, good morning, and um, this is, well, I, I, I'm going to say sadly, this will be our, our last Bible study until the end of summer, um, and, uh, you know, originally I thought we were going to go through till July 17th, and then I found out that, well, BBS needs, needs the space, and so then started looking at it, and it was kind of like, okay, well, nice clean break. We'll stop in June, get started in September, and um, so. Uh, and but then I I thought about it, and I was like, you know, the way this is working out is is that we're having these twelve speeches to pursue wisdom, and um, they're repetitive, and so when we pick up, while it will be new content, it will feel the same. <laughs> And uh, and so in that sense, it's kind of like okay, well, and then we'll we, you know we'll do a little review and we will go over um, structure and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you if you didn't hear, um, one of our regular attendees, Elaine Woolery, passed away um, this last weekend, and um, uh, she has a son and a daughter, and then family members. Um, uh, we're working out details as far as um, services. Um, there was going to be a graveside service in Walla Walla and then a memorial service here, but we don't know the dates yet. So um, we can pray for her son, Marshall, as he is um, trying to deal with all of this. And he really does need our prayers. Um, I think he's getting great love by the church, and that's... Um, Good. Some of you in the room are part of that, and um, so um, yeah. Uh, so with that, let's pray. Also, Rob, okay. Priscilla Fox is having her surgery today. Oh, and Priscilla Fox is having her surgery today. Okay. Lord, thank you for this morning, and as we um, remember Elaine, we give thanks for her, and um, we rejoice that we have the hope that you've given us, um, that she is with you. You are the God of the living, not the dead. Uh, our lives do not end when these bodies give way, but we look forward to resurrection. Um, we ask blessings for Marshall. Uh, we also lift up Priscilla to you and pray that her procedure, Lord, um, is absolutely successful, that you would protect her and bless her. Uh, be with the doctors. Be with us today as we um, continue to hear the call towards um, wisdom. Uh, bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, chapter 4, looking to try to catch up so that we actually get to chapter 5. And um, so I think we're on verse 20. And um, this is the, there, in chapter four, there were four or three separate speeches. And so one of the things to note is that when you're reading through these, um, this first collection of Proverbs, um, where you have uh, a prologue, an epilogue, a little summary beginning, a little summary ending, and then you have 12 other speeches, 10 by a father to his son. Uh, two, where we will hear wisdom speak out in the streets. Um, when it begins like this, my son, pay attention, um, that begins a new speech. And so, um, so in verse 20, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Um, you know, hopefully what's happening over time for us is that we're reading this and we're beginning to learn the language of wisdom that is presented to us in Proverbs. Um, there, it's something that we should pursue, so the pay attention, uh, the listen closely. Um, it is about learning the content. Um, it is about you being diligent and committed. Some of the metaphors that we've heard is like digging for gold 
uh, or pursuing precious uh, silver. It is something that you are going to work at. Um, historically, in context, it, you know, some of us were probably that our education was a little bit more like this. They don't do this as much today, but a lot of these things would have been learned by rote. You, you know, that you would have been thinking of memorizing so that the words come to mind. I mean, that's the paying attention, keeping these words, um, keeping them within your heart. Uh, do not let them out of your sight. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. And um, wisdom is skillful living. Um, you know, we're, we've talked about this tension. Generally speaking, there, there, you know, you're going to find exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, uh, wise living is going to mean good health. Um, sometimes uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but this is the general pattern of things. Uh, above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. Um, when you hear the word heart, what are you beginning to think of? Your will. Your will. Okay. Anybody else? That's the center of it. There could be more ideas. Personhood. Personhood. Maybe from the sense of the interior of who you are, the center of your being. And other ideas? Um, it's... It's the seat from which you live, like the throne, your heart. It's and and you know, and this is the part. Somebody sits on it, and what you want to do is, is you want your heart to be led by the Lord, so that you give Him the lead of what you do. It speaks of will, volition. It it has the idea of a, your mind is associated with it. We can distinguish between the heart and the mind, but the heart, the will, um, needs. To be rational it needs to be based on an understanding. So your heart grows in understanding. Um, and so there is a discerning element. It includes passion. It includes feeling. But it is, again, primarily that, that seed of choice. Okay. So we're reading through these things. We're reflecting on them. There's this call to wisdom. Guard your heart. What would it look like? To guard your heart. To pay carefully attention to how you choose to live. Ideas? What you listen to, study, read. Be discerning in what you listen to, study, and read. Right. Yes? What you put into it. What you put in matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is, there, there is, it seems to me that in our culture we will find, um, I'll pick on a low-hanging fruit, um, and, and it's, it's associated a little bit with where we go the next time. You know, there, there's a part where it's like, our, our culture will act as if it doesn't really matter what content you focus on. And so, for example... You know, our, our culture for a couple decades now has really promoted pornography as something that should just be seen as common things that people do. You know, we're sexual beings and the sex has appetites, so go ahead and just feed it and, you know, use these things. Now, everything in biblical theology would tell you, don't listen to that, that's a lie, but that's where our society is at. Um, we should sit there and stand back and say, are we surprised that our society is messed up sexually? No. You know, what you focus on and how you focus on and what you choose to do matters. And so you don't fill yourself up with that content. This is a wellspring of poison that's going to kill you. Um, and so guarding your heart is, yeah, being concerned about what you allow in, what you focus your attention on. Um, one of the things that we've heard is, is that you also need to be wary about your peers and your influence. And, you know, this is the part where we're to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We should have friends in our life who speak truth to us 
and don't just tell us. This will be something you'll hear later on. What our itchy ears are, are, are wanting to hear, but instead will hold us to the truth. Um, who you, you know, so who you relate with, um, what you allow in. Um, remember the language of pathway, walk, road. A big part of guarding your heart are the, are the simple choices that you make every day to choose to do the good. Um, and, and we know, uh, we, we especially know that our brains are, are developed for this way. We develop neural pathways. And so, you know, and, and every day the choices that we make are laying down a pattern. And so, you know, when, as we intentionally choose healthy rhythms and habits, it leads to a good life. Um, and so, um, you know, you get up and it's like, okay, I'm going to make certain choices today. I've got a plan. I'm going to choose the good. I'm going to fill my mind with good thoughts. Um, I'm going to reflect on what I do. I'm going to uh, examine the choices that I've made. I'm going to correct the paths. All, and all of that would be guarding your heart, which is the seat of your will. Perry, I thought I saw a hand. I would, you used the word discerning, and I think as we in the church, we use, you know, test it against the Bible. Yes. You know, protecting our heart for things coming in. It, yeah, and, yeah, that, and that's, yeah, that's the, the primary way that we get the truth of, of what and content that we should have. Yeah. Um, again, out of the idea of what we're learning from Proverbs is, is that, True wisdom is found only with God because he's the only one who knows the beginning and the end and everything in between. And so the way of life for us is Old Testament terminology, fear of the Lord, um, appropriate relationship with God of reverence, respect, and um, obedience. Okay. Above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Be careful how you talk. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Um, okay, so here, here the father is giving the son concrete. Here's a way to guard your heart. Be careful what you do with your mouth. Be careful of your speech. Um, So, coarse talk, um, demeaning talk, um, gossip. Um, you know, I, I was I was I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and, and there was a reflection about kind of you know the way relationships work, and and the person was making an observation of you know you know. I mean, these people, they get along well, but whenever they get together, they just, they, they spend all of their time gossiping. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and that becomes a pattern. And, you know, and, uh, and then, it, you know, and it's this part where it's like, you know, like we're going to hear this in, in, in different aphorisms as we go forward, but, but words matter. And if you if you if if the words that spill out of your mouth always are critical and always tearing down, it trains you on how you look and how you think. And and instead of lifting other people up, instead of being you know a balm of life that, that you know helps encourage people, um, you you get you can get stuck in that. So you want to be careful of your speech. Um, it, yeah, I mean. We're moving to more coarseness in the way people talk. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be too long, and you just expect explicatives, you know, to be just everywhere on television. You know, I mean, it, already. And, and, I mean, the Isle of Costco. What? I mean, everywhere in the Isle of Costco. Yeah. Some uh, man is dumping on his wife and his mother-in-law, and they're screaming and yelling in Costco. <laughs> it's terrifying. In, in Costco. Like out, yeah, yeah. I remember watching a movie. If John Wade said "damn," they they bleeped it out. 
<laughs> now it's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, there's words that you know you never used to hear just on regular television. And, um, I, you know, and, and this is the part where, I mean, even if you were raised this way, you know, so like, I was raised in a pretty salty environment when it came to language, you know. We had, we didn't go to worship on Sunday, we had the Sunday fights. <laughs> and, and the Sunday fights were mostly verbal. Every once in a while, you duck so that you, you know, something flying through the air would, you know, it would miss you. But it wasn't aimed at you anyways, it was, but anyways, it was, I mean, I'm just giving you, I'm not, and I'm not joking about this. And it, you know, but it was kind of funny because, you know, still in, in my parents' generation, there was some expectation that, that you know, you, you, you really weren't supposed to speak this way. At least don't let the kids speak this way. So, I, I mean, I always remember this, is that one time I said, dang. And my dad was like, what did you just say? <laughs> dang? <laughs> That's too close to damn. Yeah. What? <laughs> and I got in trouble. And you know, and, and there's part of me that's kind of like, yeah. how does this work? Yeah. You and mom <laughs> say everything, and I get in trouble. But, but I can still say to this day that my my parents have never heard me say an expletive. Ralph, I never heard my father ever speak. You never heard your father ever. Um, you are blessed. <laughs> you are blessed. Oh yes. But yeah, but that's the part where there's been this breakdown. Mm -hmm. But that's the part where now you and you and I as Christians, we're supposed to be different. We are supposed to, to care about our and we're supposed to control it. Now I would warn you, I don't expect non Christians to get this. So I don't I you know, like, so I, I, I've never been this person who, who sits there and, you know, is really uptight with non-Christians about the language that they speak. But they know that I don't speak that way. I, 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 I mean, like, you know, and so, like, and part of it was, you know, because I grew up with it. I mean, I, I don't get shocked by it. I don't do it. But I'm not going to let that get in the way of me trying to form a relationship with this person. But hopefully the, the difference between how they... Speak, And I also sit there and I go, there's a certain laziness. I mean, you know, I, I had this one person I worked with and every fifth to seventh word was an expletive. And it was like, well, well yeah. he's got a very limited vocabulary. Yeah, sure. I, can, I can give you a lot more descriptive words right, that right. describe this than what you're doing. And none of them are, you know, are, are words that we tend to say are crass and stuff like that. But there's two parts to it. There's the words that you choose and there's the intent which you choose. And you want to be both avoiding crass talk, and you want to be avoiding um, overly critical. I mean, there's a place for judgment, but there's a difference between, you know, saying, huh, that's probably not a good choice, and tearing somebody down with your words. If you were around somebody, like at work, or family, or somebody that used, like, Jesus Christ as a swear word all the time, would you at some point talk to them about it, or what would you say, or would you just ignore it? Yeah, so, oh, oh, good question. So, I'm around somebody, and, and and they use Jesus Christ, and they're not praying, but they're using it. They're, they're really doing the Lord's name in vain. There's, all they're doing is basically using Jesus' name as a curse word. How would I respond to that? It would depend on the depth of relationship. So, one of my, you know, like, Patrick Smith and I are out golfing. And the first nine holes were, you know, we've never met these people before. And they are swearing up a storm. You know, I mean, you know, just all over the place. We're, and, you know, we're, we're laughing with them, getting along with them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we get to hole number 10 and they finally turn to the question, so what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> they actually swore again, but it was kind of in the shock, right? They just could what? And, um, you know, and in one sense, I felt like, okay, so in that situation, the very fact that, you know, for nine rounds they could get along with me, and, the, and, and there, there was no sense of condemnation, I think that was kind of the positive thing. I was going, you know, I'm not going to just be this uptight person that just by the very, I, I don't, but 
If somebody was a friend of mine, and, and they were non-Christian, then eventually I'm going to say something. You know, because they're going to know. You know, and it's like, and, and, I, and, I, and I have done that. What do you say? And, and I say, well, you know, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this, but oftentimes, and it's one of these things where it's kind of interesting to me that this happens, that you use Jesus' name, but you're just saying it more like a curse, and it hurts me. And, and, you know, I haven't said anything up to this point because I didn't want to, like, turn you off. But, you know, we're friends now. So just so you know, that, I mean, that, and they're like, I, I said that? And I said, well, I do believe that there's power in Jesus' name. And I think it's one of the reasons. But, yeah, you do. And um, now, with a Christian, I would get there a lot more quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because then, but, but, but I, I, but, you know, but there still needs to be some relational context. Um, but for, for this, whereas like you know, and, and you know, and that's the part where I, I try to put things in questions. Um, Jesus was really good about asking questions, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like so. Okay, so how do you how do you you know how do you approach the way that you that you, that you speak with what Jesus would want you to do? You know, and instead of just you know. You know, slapping them down and saying, you know, you know, it looks like you're pretty inconsistent and, you know, you're like a bad Christian. Because, you know, it's like, no, I want them to be processing this stuff. But um, with a non-Christian, I, I, I more get to the point of kind of sharing with them, you know, in this instance, the way that they're using their language just has an impact on me. And I, and I like being with them, but it does hurt me. And, and I just wanted them to know it. It's interesting that they use his name at all. I mean... It's like, I, I said a couple, I said, oh my, oh, you, I didn't know that you had a relationship with Jesus, you know, when they just, Jesus Christ, I was like, oh, wow, great, you know, and then they kind of laugh. And it's, it's the, I'm shocked as far as like in movies, because it's like, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they've written it into the script, right? Of course, of course. You know, and it's kind of like, that's really intentional. So why are they writing that into the script? But anyways. The screenplay puts it right in. <laughs> okay, so put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. And the, and the idea here is, is that directly ahead on the straight path, keep your eyes fixed on those things that are good. Don't, don't look at perverse ways. Don't look to be tempted. Um, don't, you know, and, and this could be at this point, um, broadly speaking, you know, I mean, this is the part where we're going to have different temptations. Um, some of us are going to covet, some of us are going to lust, some of us are going to um, become judgmental, and, uh, you know, and we'll, and, and our gaze, and it's saying, you know, think about what you focus on. And, and there is that thing of, that's something as far as you and I have the ability, and this is what the heart does, is the ability to choose what we focus on. Um, our minds can wander, and there's not much you can do about it, but you can train yourself to refocus. And, and scripture memorization becomes a great thing here. Because then it's like, you know, you train yourself when your mind wanders, um, you know, and so, you know, simple lessons as far as um, forming habits. If, if there's a sense of conviction that, um, uh, you know, the, this, I'm going to pick on speech here. The language that comes out of my mouth is too critical, and, and, and it also leads me into gossip. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to intentionally try not to say anything negative about anybody else. And if I, if, I, if I fail, then I'm going to pray for that person and, and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to say a scripture that comes to mind. And so and then there's things that you can do where you trigger and it's like, okay, when I make that mistake, then I'm going to do this. And slowly over time, those can be things that will help you um, guard your tongue. Uh, 
Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. But let me tell you one thing, though. I mean, and I, and I agree with this, but, I, but, I, but I've actually talked with some ladies who have been hurt by this. One of the big problems in our culture today is, you know, just the, the, our problems with, with dealing with ourselves as sexual beings, very obviously. Um, in Christian circles, one of the things, and we should take it seriously, and we actually have, you know, we have groups uh, to help with this. It's both a man problem and a woman problem, but it tends to be more of a man problem, and that's the issue of lust and pornography. And one of the things that they teach you is, um, and, they, and one of the terms for this is bouncing your eyes. You know, and, and you know that's the part where it's like lust becomes a conscious choice. You, you know, this is the part where you know when you look at somebody and you look at them and you go, oh, they're beautiful. There's no sin in that. But when you look at somebody and then you start to fantasize about them sexually, that becomes lust and that is a sin. It's not the worst sexual sin, but it is the pathway into a whole bunch of sexual sin. And so one of the things that, that you know they train to do, and it's one of these things, is to say, okay, so if you're a guy and you're struggling and you look at a woman, you, you bounce your eyes and you don't look at her for very long. <laughs> And there is a place of sitting there saying, okay, that might be something, but, but, but also, the redemption is, is that it's not just what you're not doing, you don't look at women and you look at them lustfully, but instead that you can look at a person, see them as a person, and they, and they can feel valued as a person. And if all you ever do is bounce your eyes and not look at somebody of the opposite sex, they can feel like, am I even here? And so there's a little bit here where it's like, okay, so there may be a time where you have to do some training to bounce your eyes. But at the very same time, the goal is not to not look at a woman. It's not to look at a woman lustfully and instead to see a woman and to see them as a person. And so that's something within this where it's like, keep your eyes straight. Now... This is a little bit of a cultural thing. I mean, they were much more uptight in, in, in other cultures about women keeping their faces covered when they went out in public because, well, they knew that, you know, men would look at women and they would often look at them lustfully. But in our society, it may, it may make it difficult. It may, it may be hard, especially for some men who've been really grabbed a hold of by sexual lust. But... Looking straight doesn't mean always bouncing your eyes and never looking at somebody of the opposite sex. It means becoming the type of person who looks and sees a person and doesn't use somebody as an object for their own gratification. I have a comment. So what you said about um, training yourself, like if you're going to gossip or think something bad about someone and then instead you pray for them. I had an experience where uh, like two years ago my neighbor got a trampoline and it had these squeaky, squeaky, <laughs> squeaky, you know. And so, and the kids would go out and jump at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and so if I wanted to go to bed early, I'd hear this squeaking. And um, I tried to talk to them, and they were not responsive. Mm -hmm. You know, could you do a little earlier? Uh, maybe you can oil them or something. But they were not <laughs> responsive. So every night, I was finding myself getting mad. Mm -hmm. Like, I would lay in the bed. I'd wait for the sound, I'd hear it coming, I'd be like, for half an hour I'm going to have to hear this, and it would make me mad. And, um, and I thought, this isn't right, you know, I'm in a bad mindset towards them. So I started praying for them. Every time I heard that squeak, I said, I'm going to pray for that family. And I'd think of all these things, pray for them, and it just became a habit mm -hmm. to, as soon as I heard that, and it changed my heart towards mm -hmm. them. And they did stop, eventually. So uh, that's a great that's a great thing to do is to pray for someone when you're old. Yep. Well, and young young men right now, their eyes are going to be bouncing all over the place because <laughs> the way that girls dress. I mean, my grandson's like 15, and it's it's yeah. You know, it's just hard because there's so much in you know. Yeah. You know, there's a certain part where in our society, the, uh, probably all you know. I mean, uh, all of us 
but especially you know people who are younger who are really caught up into this and and those who aren't married yet but I'm going to say all of this it, it has been such a sustained attack about sexual mores in our society that you know we're the frogs in the kettles yeah. and 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 we probably all of us lack a little bit of a perspective about what sexual purity really is and and how good that it is i mean and that's the part and, you know and so so you know there is a certain part where it's just like yeah we we live we live in a very aggressive and dangerous culture when it comes to sexuality um and, and, and you know, and the kids are the targets of it because they're getting programmed right. into it. And um, even the Buzz yeah. Lightyear, they have two female toys kissing. It's like what? Yeah, really? And, <laughs> yeah. The, the comment was, you know, you, you know, even even in a children's movie uh, made by Disney, they're they're pushing sexuality issues, LGBTQ agenda, and they very intentionally added the the kiss between uh, two two lesbians into the movie as a political statement. So, yeah. So kids see it as a normal see, so they don't yeah. Let your eyes look straight ahead, fix your gaze directly before you, make level paths for your feet, and take only ways that are firm. Um, and this is very much talking about this intentionality of wisdom is choosing the good. It's being committed to the good. It is, it is refusing any way of evil. It is you thinking about your steps. Um, beyond reproach is one of the things that we get in the New Testament, especially leaders, but really all of us, is that we have a reputation. And, and, and reputations, you know, I mean, they, they can be powerful. I mean, this is the part where, where when, when we live in a society where, where you know, there, there's so much brokenness when you can have a person of integrity, it, it stands out. And, and we're to be people of integrity because we carefully walk our ways, choosing the good, going straight, um, thinking about where we're going to step, not stepping into something that's evil or smelly or disgusting or wrong. Um, yeah. We don't do this out of terror. We do this out of a desire for what to, for for blessing and life and goodness, right? It, um, you know, like so. When I became a pastor, I knew that we are one of the most audited groups of people, and I was a math planner. I'm really good at math. It's very easy for me, and I went. I'm going to pay the money and I'm going to have an accountant do my taxes because I'm probably going to get audited at some point and all I want to do is, is to be beyond reproach. Um, and I would hate it if, you know, I made some mistake and because, you know, and, for, and there's a little more convoluted with some of the stuff for taxes for pastors, right? Just was, you know what? I'm just going to pay the money so that that... Um, there are certain things where it's like, you will not find a couch in my office. <laughs> and there's a reason. It's very much sterile. I've got a, you know, I've got a desk, I've got a chair, I've got tables, I've got nothing. Uh -uh. <laughs> I, because, well, the last thing I, I, I would ever, ever want is for there to be a hint of sexual immorality. Um, you know, so, and, and that's the thing where it's just like, uh, and I, and I'm, you know, and, and <laughs> there's, there's, you know, Billy Graham would never even get into an elevator with a woman by himself. Huh. I don't do that. Yeah. I, I'm kind of like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I, but I'm, I'm still cautious, you know, I mean, that's the part where I think about these things. I'm. I'm careful about how I step, um, you know, and, so, and, and it's because it's like, okay, so I, I, do, I don't want to do something that would, would in any way,
cause the church or Jesus to look bad. And so, you know, and that's, that's what's being said here is, is that we would think that way. Wanting the good, doing the good, looking for the good, making sure um, that, we, you know, we don't do anything that is evil. Do not swerve to the right or the left to keep your foot from evil. Okay, right into chapter 5. Next speech, um, if you have, most of your Bibles will have some sort of little um, title that says, Warning from Adultery. Uh, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and that your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. Now, there's going to be an interesting thing that happens in this, in this speech. It's all of chapter 5. And... Notice that it begins and the sun is singular. We're going to get to a place where the sun's is plural, and we're going to talk about that. There is um, a connection between what this section is going to be about with knowledge, speech, and adultery. Um, sexual relations are relations. One of the words that we use for it is intercourse. Intercourse is this giving of back. There's, a, there's this time here of, of the speech. Of, you know, you and I could be engaged in verbal intercourse because we are, and, and, and that's the nature of things. It's something that you engage in that's relational. It's, and, you know, the very best lovemaking usually, you know, is, is expressive bodily, but in words. You know, gets to speech. We woo one another. We, you know, you, you love somebody, and sometimes you're, you're inspired to poetry. Um, so anyways, that, that's, that's going on here. And the father is speaking to the son, talking about knowledge, listening carefully to my words, thinking about the way that you speak, and this is going to get tied to the issue of adultery, but this is the part about not being enticed into adultery, which typically they're going to be words. Okay. So is he saying, be careful of temptation? Be careful of... Now. Okay. Now. Sorry. Most... No, no. Be careful of temptation, and in particular, sexual temptation. Right. And sexual temptation isn't just about looking... But there's the enticing part of using words, and I want you to think about the words because somebody's going to say, "Okay, so you're going to love this." Oh yeah. So could you come over to my house because I need your help, mm -hmm. and if you help me, you'll appreciate it. You know, and, and, and you know, and so you know, and it's like, okay, so I want you to think about what you're really hearing, and when you're hearing this words of enticement. Because her lips are going to drip like honey. Now, they didn't have sugar back then, right? <laughs> so honey was like your, one of your main sweeteners. Sweet. And it tastes good. Mm -hmm. Especially when things don't have much sweetness, and then you get something that's sweet. And it's like, wow, that. Like, I remember the first time that I had an orange fresh off the tree when I went down to Arizona. And it was like... What have been these things I've gotten from the grocery store? This, they, they, this is so much better. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how good this tastes compared to that. Um, just so you know, commentators will speak about this passage that, that the metaphors here have a mixture of sexual connotation. So, um, it's more explicit in Hebrew as far as it is as is, 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 is going. So, um, yeah. And this is where the scriptures are, I mean, the father is in some way speaking frankly about the son, to the son, 
and sitting there and he's and he's using euphemisms that could be referring to sexual acts on top of the reality of the knowledge and the speech and they go together. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay, where was I at? So, for the lips of an adulteress drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end, she is bitter as gall. So, and the bitter as gall goes back to the sweetness of honey. Okay, in the beginning, it may seem nice. But there is a reason that God says no adultery. Because it hurts. And it doesn't end nice. And it is a source of great destruction. Um, there's going to be, typically, our, our, our society's gotten a little bit more perverse in this, but typically there's going to be a husband who's not happy when his wife commits adultery with somebody else. And it is going to lead to a spiraling of, uh, of danger, threat, and violence, and death. This talk is about that in part. Um, so, it may seem sweet in the beginning, it may seem smooth, but that smoothness will get very sharp because this will be like a double-edged sword and it will impale you. In the end, she is bitter gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Um, her steps lead straight to the grave. Um, yeah, uh, um, there's a there's a play here a little bit of from top to bottom and the feet going down to death and um, the the bottom of her that that entices you um, will entice you towards the grave. This adulterous woman, this unchaste woman who tries to entice you in. She, she's foolish. And she gives no thought to the way of life. Um, now, just so you know, you, the, I mean, this is the father speaking to the son about being enticed by his adulterous woman. We can, you can transpose this yeah. easily. I mean, that, that's the part where it's like, um, her paths are crooked, but she does not know it. Um, she, she, the person may not know any better, but you're supposed to know better because you're supposed to listen to the Father. You're supposed to listen to wisdom. Um, you know, th they can sit there and they can use their words and they can say, this will be beautiful, he'll never find out, nobody has to know, this will feel really good, I'm lonely, you're lonely. Um, now I'm starting to sound like love songs. Let's <laughs> let's 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 get it to go, let's get it on. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a song. Let's get it on. Um, and so, um, but you know, you have this where it's like, okay, here's the speech, and and again, remember, this was all about paying attention to the words, and these words can sound enticing. Um, you know, and this goes back to the thing where it's like, this is specifically about. Adultery, right? And adultery is, is that, so, and it's speaking to the son. We're presuming the son is not married at this point, and he's coming alive sexually. You know, he could be a late teenager, could be in his early 20s, may not be, and, you know, it's somebody who's not married yet. And then here's this woman, and she... And she is sexually alive, but she is married. Um, oh, she's married? Yeah, that's, so, to, it, it, somebody said, you know, she's married. So, adultery is the, is the, is the sexual crime where one person, at least one person is married, and you're having sex with somebody who's married. And so, in this... He's talking about an adulterous woman, somebody who's been married, and then you sleep. And the warning is, is this, this is going to be bad for you. Um, now, um,
the, new, the Old Testament has different um, punishments um, or no punishments at all for men when it comes to sex. So um, the adultery is the, is the sexual crime that's punishable by death. And the community was supposed to stone you. Both of you. Um, you know, we're, we're going to look at the woman caught in adultery from John chapter 8 this Sunday. And they only pull out the woman. Yeah. And, um, and that speaks to you that they really weren't concerned with holiness or the community. They were concerned with trapping Jesus in a lie. Um, now... The father is speaking to the son within the context of the old covenant and saying, beware the adulterous woman because this will not go well for you. The punishment is death. She may speak smooth words to you. Um, what she offers may be very enticing, um, but don't go that way. If we were to go forward to the New Testament, we would want to listen to Paul's advice. Flee all sexual immorality. <laughs> don't reason with it. Don't rationalize with it. Don't try to stand there and argue. Actually, just get out of there. That is good practical advice. Now, verse 7. Now then, listen. Now, now then. Now, this is the interesting part here. Remember, this was the father speaking to his son. My son, listen to these words. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep a path far from her. Do not go near now, the last time we came across this, the sons there, I argued, it was, was actually not him now speaking to a group of his sons, but he's speaking across generations. And the same thing is most likely going on here again. So, um, now then, the men in the Kinnaker line... <laughs> Let me give you carefully, do not turn aside from my, what I say. Keep to the path far from her. Do not go near her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel, lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life you will groan, and then your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hate a discipline. Now, what's going on here is there is a double warning about um, reputation and riches, strength and honor. That, that if you go with her, you will lose these things, which were some of the most important things for you and your line. The weakest link can break the chain. You could be the end of the Kinnaker line. Um, the, the punishment of adultery is death, and then your line gets cut off. You could lose everything. So I want now. This is not the way that we get trained to think anymore, right? We're so individualistic. It's just about my personal happiness. There isn't this sense of honor and shame and what we're doing within our family lines. And, but, you know, that their culture was, was that. So, you know, I have this little phrase in my head, we Kinnickers don't lie. That was mostly true. I can tell you that it wasn't always true. And, and there was a little hypocrisy in that. But, but, that but, but that's the part where it's like, there is something about saying, here's how we do it. Now, thinking generationally, you don't want to do this. I mean, you know, your forefathers will be cut off because you did this and then you die and your wealth is given to another. Our wealth, our family inheritance gets taken. And so, so anyways, that's the, the nature of this middle call. Now, This overall speech, it's, it's, it's gonna, it, it looks, it's a warning against the negative. The negative in your own life, the negative for your, your whole line, your generation. 
And then it's going to move into, okay, so, and this is always good, wise things. It's, so you want to avoid the bad things because you want to embrace the good things. And adultery is a really bad thing. But the issue is not the, the act of making love. The issue is who you make love with. So we are going to get a little celebration of love making between a husband and a wife in the next section. But let's finish this out. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep the path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. The, the, the years to the one is cruel could be translated differently, and it, and it has a connotation of, of honor or reputation. Dignity, my Dignity. Dignity. Yeah. So we're, we're not quite sure what to do with the Hebrew. There's a little bit of debate. Um, Bruce Walkey would side with the idea of dignity, and he likes that what's going on here is, is that we have the one sense of your power, your dignity, and your wealth can be taken away from you, which is absolutely what could happen. I, I, you know, I mean, the, 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 the one place in society now where... At least publicly, there's a little bit more shame as when public cert politicians get caught in adultery and then, you know, and then they, they lose their good name. But even that today isn't always the case. Um, and so, but, that, but you could lose your good name, but also you could lose your stuff. You know, I mean, this is the part where, and your access to the stuff. At the end of your life, you will groan. When your flesh and body are spent, you will say, how I hated discipline. This is going, you know, as you go down to the grave, there will be regret. How my heart spurned correction. You're looking back and you were the weak link and you devastated your family by this terrible choice. Um, I would not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. And so you want to avoid that. You don't want that sort of shame. You don't want to look back and say, I'm the Kinnaker that destroyed the Kinnaker line. So I'm going to think carefully about the steps, and I'm not going to go near the door of the adulteress. I know she invited me over, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, it doesn't say that, but verse 15, this is where the turn happens. Drink water from your own cistern, Running water from your own well. Get filled up with life. Be refreshed. Um, should your springs overflow in the streets? Your streams of water in the public squares? By no means. That's foolish. Instead, there is a proper place for jealousy. And, and that is, is that you should be jealous to secure the honor and purity of your own marriage bed. And you should honor it. And you should pursue it. Um, don't try to go and get filled up out in the streets. Instead, look for that in your home. May your fountain be blessed. And may, re and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. And then we get this celebration. It, it, the problem is not love making. The problem is where and with who. Mm -hmm. And what God wants to do is wants to bless a husband and a wife, and that you might love one another and, and and bless one another and please one another. And so, rejoice in the wife that you married, the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord. And he examines all his path. Um, everything we do is before God and he sees everything that we do and yet somehow we still seem to try to suppress that reality and ignore it and sometimes forget it. Um, but it, he, it, none of it is hidden. 
for a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. If you had that memorized, and that was something that walked with you every day of your life, you would probably avoid sin more frequently than you do right now. Um, the evil deeds of the wicked man ensnare him, the cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. And so, and, and that, that becomes the story of, of adultery. Don't go looking to be with another man's wife. Learn to be satisfied and, and, and find your life and the one that you've committed to because this, this act is intended to be a blessing, but a blessing here. And if you do, it will fill you up. But if you don't, you will be disappointed. You may end up ruining not just you, but generations. And, um, and that's the warning that we find in chapter 5. Is it always with adulterous women, with adulterers, or is there ever a conversation to a son about just another girl? Or is there, there, is there a conversation? There are going to be things about um, not uh, of, of not igniting desire prematurely. Um, the uh, There's a couple passages that I want to look at just to confirm what what Deuteronomy says. That in the this is the part where in the Old Testament you got to look at the fact that God is bringing the people forward, and it's kind of still elementary. And so um, the law was not as Harsh in the Old Testament in some ways as the New Testament. That may sound surprising. Because there was a part where it was like, okay, so no adultery, but you don't get into trouble if you sleep with a, with a foreigner or somebody who's not married. Though the woman was supposed to stay virginal. Yeah. 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 So in some of this, this is where we come into the New Testament and we sit there and we say in the New Testament we get greater clarity as far as what God's expectations are. So, in the New Testament, Jesus affirms that marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman. We get the warning not to have many wives, but we don't get the command not to have many wives in the Old Testament. Um, and, and so, but in the New Testament, it's affirmed. Now, if you read carefully the Old Testament, you can, and because Jesus is the one who reads it this way, you look at the fact that... Um, in Genesis, when it says that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh, it's one man and one woman, and that's the marriage ideal. And then Jesus comes back and he reaffirms it and he um, underlines the fact, one man, one woman, that's God's idea. That's the biblical idea of marriage, not somebody who's married to many wives. Um, Furthermore, when you get into the New Testament, then you have this heightening. All forms of sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman is a sin and is sexual immorality. Um, and just lusting is a sin. And that's where, you know, the, the, in this area, that's where the, his disciples and people heard his teaching and they're like, whoa. Okay. Um, and so in all of that, it's like, okay, so in the end, we're not just Old Testament people, we're New Testament people, and the wisdom that we get in the New Testament, and this is a little bit why I even made some references to some of the things in the New Testament, you know, like you can move forward to Paul, and Paul just says, leave sexual immorality, and he's using sexual immorality there in the broad sense, he's not just talking about adultery, he's talking about any form, the word in Greek is pornea, and it would refer to anything that isn't according to what's right. And so then, it, and, and the list is, is fornication, which is people who aren't yet married having sex together. Adultery, where at least one person is married and is having sex with somebody who's not married. And then any form of homosexual sex, 
where you're having sex with somebody of the same sex. All of those categorically are called sins, and we're not supposed to engage in it. And then, on top of all of that, even lust is a sin, and it would be better for us to gouge out our eyes and to lose one part of our bodies and for our whole bodies to be thrown into hell. You should take seriously all forms of um, sexual sins and flee from them. That, and, and so, it's, it's the, the place that we can say that most clearly, New Testament, with all of those definitions. Yeah. How am I doing on time? Ten o'clock. Woohoo! Wow. Okay. Uh, man, we caught up. We got through chapter yeah, five. Good job. Any, any other questions for what we covered today? No, but I do celebrate the coach from Bremerton that got Supreme Court ruling and it took him seven years, which is a biblical number. <laughs> yeah. One thing. So there's a celebration on the the ruling that um, we can practice our um, our faith and. It, and when we're practicing it in non-coercive ways in the public sphere, um, we shouldn't lose our job for that. And um, and that was the majority opinion. Um, if you were to read the minority opinion, you would see the tension that's present in our society, where one of the justices sat there and argued that um, that if you allow that sort of thing to happen, the state is implicitly condoning religion and the state should never be condoning religion. I mean, it's a very harsh sort of a position, but that's a little bit where our society is. But yes, we should celebrate because um, I, I was listening to one historian talk about the separation of church and state. You know, the language of the separation of church and state isn't in the Constitution. It is in a letter from Thomas Jefferson that he wrote as they were talking about how to frame the Constitution. But, what, but, but primarily what they were focusing on is, in the Establishment Clause is what it's called, is that the federal government is not to establish a, a church for the, for, for the country. And this is coming out of the context where you have the German state church, which was the Lutheran church, you have the Anglican state church, um, for Great Britain, um, and and they said we don't we're not going to do that. But that was at the federal level when that was discussed when the Constitution was framed. Most colonies had specific denominations that were their denomination for their colony, and it was actually assumed that states and churches could work closely together, and some states may choose to have one specific denomination that is the sponsored denomination for that particular state, and that would not have been something that would have went through the Constitution. There was a much closer understanding of how church and state would work together, but it was at the state level, not the federal level. And I found that very interesting to mm -hmm. go, we've come so far, and the story has been twisted so much, that we are now at this place where the, the assumptions could be if if you allow religion to be done on, a, on federal property, you're coercing people towards religion. Uh, but anyways, it is something to celebrate. There's a little more information on that. Let me pray for us. Yeah. Um, Tim and Cindy Ford's dog, Jimmy Lee, um, they're taking her to the ER, so oh. they're just asking that we would pray and, and uh, hopefully the dog will be okay. What's the dog's name? Jenny Lee. Jenny Lee. Mm -hmm. And I have one more. Okay. My daughter-in-law, Kimberly, just had a baby, six Yay. years old, right? So she, um, last night, her blood pressure shot way up, and they told her to go to the ER. So I was over there taking care of the baby until 2 in the morning. And they're really concerned because they couldn't get it down um, for quite a while. And now they're watching it and trying to see what's going on with her. So prayers for Kimberly. Kimberly? Lord, thank you again for the gift of your word and your desire for us to become wise. Um, Lord, may we, all of us, pursue wisdom. May we seek to align our lives with your revelation and your truth and who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you are a gracious and good God who loves us and um, calls us to partner with you. And one of the ways that we get to do that is when we pray. Lord, we lift up um, Jenny Lee to you and pray for Tim and Cindy and, and um, 
Lord, uh, very obviously they're, they want their dog to live. And so, Lord, may you help the vets deal with what's going on and, and help um, them have more time uh, with their beloved uh, pet. Uh, we lift up Kimberly to you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the new baby, and um, she's quite beautiful. Um, but, Lord, we lift up this situation and why she had to go to the emergency room, and, and the, the doctors are still at a loss of what's happening, and we pray, Lord, that you will provide both wisdom and understanding of what's going on, and may they be able to help treat her and bring her to full health. Lord, we know that you can you can work through us, but but we also know that you can work beyond us. And we pray for Kimberly that Lord, you would use um, your power and um, and strength to to help her be healed. Uh, bless her, Lord, and keep her in Jesus' name. And Carol McGilliard's having a procedure tomorrow. Yeah, Carol McGilliard's having a surgery tomorrow. Thursday, I think. Tomorrow, yeah. Which, yeah, today's Wednesday, so tomorrow. And then she's going to Ingalls Creek, so that's yeah. cool. Wow. <laughs> okay. Have a great um, summer. Yeah, thank you.